Thank you guys for coming out and listening to Brad and I talk. We're going to look at some trends in sow mortality, uh, look at some potential driving factors of those trends, and then some intervention strategies that our clinic has tried to combat those. So before we get into it, as with any Swine Vet Center PowerPoint, I want to thank the rest of our group. Uh, it's really a group effort on this, and we get a lot of good discussion from our vet meetings here. So why are we talking about sound mortality today? Uh, number one, it's the cost of producers. So you, that cost comes from replacing that animal's productivity in the form of another guilt, and you also lose out on an opportunity cost and coal value. When you look a layer deeper, <coughs> sound mortality can cause you to end up keeping lower quality breeding stock in your farm and replacing that production <coughs> excuse me uh, replacing that production with keeping a larger pool of low quality animals and you can kind of get in a downward spiral where you got to make targets and due to those targets you end up keeping an animal that you would have normally culled. Uh, another reason that we're up here talking about sound mortality today is that this is not an easy story to tell. Uh, sound mortality being on the rise the past five years especially. I know when I talk to my friends who aren't involved in the pork industry that they'll ask why, and it always generates good discussion, but you don't always get an open-minded individual. So we worked with Brad Eckberg and Meta Farms and able to look at some data over the past five years in terms of sound mortality and try and identify some trends to talk about for this discussion. Uh, one of those we just wanted to look at, has death loss gone up? And this graph, I think, does a really nice job of saying, yep, 2013, you can see we're right around that 8, 8.5% mark, and now current day have jumped up to 11. So this next graph, also put together by Metafarms, uh, <coughs> just looks at each month breakdown by year uh, sow death loss. So you can, it's a really nice visual representation at the bottom here. The big takeaway is it's 2013, and then as we come up, there's 2016 and 2017 right at the top there. So we do see an increase all through the months there. This next graph, we wanted to look at, okay, our best farms. Can our best farms remain the best? So the top 10 percentiles, they will stay pretty consistent here between 5.3 and 5.8%. So it says, yeah, you know, we can do this. We can strive to be that 5% farm. So here's another one looking at the top five causes of mortality. Our number one was unknowns or others. Uh, the second highest was lameness, feet and legs. And then prolapse would have been our third. Injury and body condition, our fourth and fifth. Uh, you can see in this graph that they do actually end up making less of our total removals. And that could be because maybe we're getting better at writing down unknowns or categor categorizing our death loss. Uh, we could also be getting a little bit better putting those animals on a coal truck, but uh, still a large portion of our mortality comes from those five. So with that, uh, we're going to take a further look into the top cause of these mortalities, look at some driving factors and stuff we've tried at our clinic that we feel like's worked, and give some on-farm experiences here. And Brad's going to start us off with looking at lateness. Yeah, so really what, what Henry and I wanted to do as we, as we put that graph together, looking at top causes of mortality, we wanted to dive in deeper into a few of those that uh, uh, are the uh, highest causes in this data set and then high causes that we see uh, in other farms that aren't in, the, in that MetaFarms data set. And uh, really what we wanted to do is try and um, talk through some, some reasons we think that that mortality is high for those categories, and then hopefully you guys can go home today with some ideas on and recommendations on things that we can do differently on farm starting tomorrow that, that helps lower that mortality related to those causes. So really the first one we really wanted to take a look at is, is lameness, feet and legs. And, and Henry will get into prolapses uh, here after this section, but when we look at it, um, lameness, feet and legs, if we, if we back up, that still is anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of a herd's mortality rate um, over the last five years in this database and similar in, in other uh, data that we look at too. So that's, that's still a big deal 
on farms. And it's not only the mortality that, that we see from lameness. So we know that sows that are lame, the ones that we can limp along or, or, or get to be pregnant and then fare out, we know those have lower production, and those are ones that are uh, more likely to be culled and, and not reach their full potential. So, so lameness in general is a, is a huge deal on sow farms, not just, not just mortality. Henry and I went through and, and tried to think what are, the, what are the reasons that lameness happens on farm, and, and I'm sure we could generate a list three times the size, but we really wanted to take a look at the, the top five or six things that we think drive lameness and future mortality of sows within sow herds. Like most things, it, it all starts with the guilt. And we look at, at today's guilt in general, related to the guilt of five and ten years ago, she certainly is, is more lean, so, so less body fat, and grows a lot faster. I'm not saying that that uh, drives or that that's related directly to durability, but it does seem like when we're talking about metabolic bone diseases, bone growth, and bone strength, that uh, that faster growing guilt, if not managed correctly, uh, is more likely to become a lame animal and uh, a future mortality. Today's guilt is certainly a, a different or higher health status, and, and we want that. We want that guilt to be a high health status and then try and acclimate it to the herd that we're putting it into. Uh, I would say that for guilts that are, that are entered into herds at a, uh, a mature age, certainly, and even, even in that uh, growing stage, they have a lot of bugs to acclimate to, and some of those, some of the bacterial pathogens, certainly cause dramatic arthritis, and that's... That's damage that we may not see that first, uh, that first parity, that second parity, but eventually can catch up to those animals and then again lead to, to, uh, to lameness and sows that we end up euthanizing or that die from uh, joint infections. In general, I would say that what we see is, is today's guilt has less antibiotic treatment. Part of that is the change from VFDs. And again, as we talk about how we acclimate those gilts when we have those uh, bacterial pathogens causing arthritis and, and joint infections. Uh, less antibiotic use allows that uh, to take over more and, and can lead to more uh, of those chronic issues that, again, we see later down the road, may not see it in the, in the growing guilt. And I, and I would say also that today's guilt has nutritional limitations, too. Again, we talk about a faster-growing guilt, probably has uh, nutritional needs that we have not yet understood what those, what those are. And so, again, we probably don't feed the gilt right relative to its growth potential. And, uh, and in herds where we don't have the right number of, of gilt developer diets or, or because of facilities we just can't feed that gilt right, or after she's entered in the sow farm, we limit feed her um, unknowingly or, or intentionally, we do limit that growth. And that, that gilt is still growing at that time. And so we, we do lead to structure issues, to bone strength issues that, that catch up with that gilt later on down the road as she's a, an older parity sow. Just some examples of, of what I'm talking about, arthritis that becomes chronic in these animals. So on the, uh, on the left is, is mycoplasma hyosynoviae arthritis. And so that can become a chronic lesion in that, in that joint that, again, that, that animal may not display lameness in the growing period, but eventually uh, that can become a chronic lesion that uh, uh, no longer becomes weight-bearing and is a guilt that we, or excuse me, is a sow that we end up uh, euthanizing because they're no longer able to, to bear weight on all four limbs. The other, the other uh, on the right is an OCD or an osteochondrosis lesion, and that uh, typically is from fast growth. The, the blood vessels that feed the um, the joint or the articular part of the joint don't keep up and that area dies and sloughs off. And again, that's a very, very painful lesion and one that eventually leads to, to chronic lameness. Again, an effect of, of fast growth. The other thing, and I talked about nutritional deficiencies. You know, in 10 years I've been involved in, in two pretty dramatic vitamin D deficiencies that led to uh, less calcium absorption in, in growing pigs. And so an example of rickets or, or um, rib fractures here on the, on the left and, uh, and long bone fractures in, uh, in a cross section of a, of a rear limb. And again, if that happens in, in our growing gilts, that leads to future uh, complications in bone strength. And again, a lot of these things are, are issues that happen 
well before we recognize that they're, they're a lameness uh, problem in animals. And again, once they, once they do occur, um, it's, it's really, really hard to uh, remedy that when that's, uh, when that's present. The damage has already, already been done in a lot, of, a lot of those cases. I would say in general, too, we, we probably select gilts at a, at a higher rate into sow farms, and so the, the art of gilt selection um, has probably been lost in a lot of herds, herds that, that we see today. And so I'd ask, you know, I'd ask the group, what is, your, what is your criteria for entering gilts? Is it just the ones that can walk come in, or do we, do we have some sort of uh, uh, method of evaluating feet, legs, and, uh, and structure as we're, as we're selecting gilts? Because that's an important part of reducing lameness and future mortality in the sow farm. National Pork Board has, has some really good guides for uh, feet and leg structure and, uh, and lesions, animals that we wouldn't uh, necessarily select to go into the sow farm. Uh, again, feet uh, lesion guidelines. I'm not saying we've got to pick up every, every foot and look at that. That would be ideal, but probably not going to happen. But if we can start looking at, at feet and feet lesions before we're entering gilts and, and be able to selectively cull off gilts before they go into the sow farm, we will be better at uh, reducing lameness uh, in the sow herd. Pen gestation, I, I would say that uh, no doubt the move back to pen gestation has led to uh, more lameness in sow herds. Um, we, see some, we see some herds that are managed very well and, and doesn't seem to be a uh, complication, but then other ones where that does not go well, and, and we certainly have more mortality due to uh, lameness and downers that occur in that pen gestation situation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on pen gestation, but I think some basics are really important when we talk about how we manage sows to reduce lameness in pens. So, in general, I think it goes without saying lame sows shouldn't go into a pen. We know that pens and the fighting that happens in the pen or just the pen environment can exasperate that, that lameness or that, uh, um, or that joint infection that is, that is going on. And so we need to make sure we understand that we have flow available in the barn that we can individually house lame sows and not put them in a pen. For those that are loading pens post-implantation, I think it's important to pregnancy check before you put it into the pen because, uh, again, reducing that, that uh, riding that happens with guilt, or excuse me, Animals that cycle uh, does reduce the, uh, the incidence of lameness. And then doing things, and I, I put feed availability, but doing things that we can to uh, reduce the amount of fighting that happens those first few days uh, post uh, grouping of, of pens in pen gestation. One example is feeding extra feed during those first few days. They're going to fight, but the things we can do to try and reduce that, again, reduces the um, the severity of lameness that happens in those animals in the pen. So again, farms should have space to gestate lame sows. So that's the other part is if they become lame in a pen, that usually is an emergency situation. We need to get those animals out um, or we will, we'll have a hard time saving them. Again, space to pull out and, and then daily evaluation. Daily pen walks to understand are there new lames that we need to address is, is certainly an important part of reducing lameness. Like I said, lameness is an emergency. Usually sows are quite good at guarding that, that, uh, that pain or that inflammation that's going on. So by the time that they become a noticeable lame animal, there's a lot of damage already done. Antibiotic treatment, you know, plus or minus as, as to whether or not that's going to have any effect. It's hard to get antibiotic into the joint, and that infection, the infectious part may be out of the joint already, and so may not have a whole lot of of benefit there. An anti-inflammatory, I think, is certainly important. We don't have a lot of options for anti-inflammatory, but, but anything we can do to try and relieve some of that pain on that joint is, is beneficial. Uh, getting mats in place for those sows that are lame, that we individually house. And then, uh, again, making a multi-day assessment. The, she's lame, I treated her, she should be fine mentality just, just doesn't work. That's a multi-day assessment and multi-day treatment to try and recover some of these, these lame sows that eventually uh, will become mortality if not. Another thing I wanted to just spend a little bit of time on is, is claw trimming. So just talking through ways that we prevent or, or reduce the, uh, the number of lame sows that, that show up in our sow herds. 
And this is one that I would say, in general, we're, we're pretty poor at day to day. Um, and I get it. The, the tools we have to trim claws in general, that, that trimmer sat on the med room wall for the last five years and really hasn't gotten used. It's hard to, hard to get that into a, a crate to, to get that toe trimmed. But we do know that long toes, long dew claws lead to further foot lesions, and uh, those lesions lead to inflammation and lead to lameness. And so it's, it's a big deal on, on these farms to, to remedy that. And so the um, you know, recommendation would be that we certainly are, are trimming toes and dew claws as we, see, as we see those issues on farms. And you, know, you don't have to use the, the previous tools we've had. There's, there's trimmers we can find that, that help that process. And uh, I would say start somewhere whether that's loading into fair weaning or at the time of weaning, get a process going where, where we're trimming toes uh, routinely uh, each day or each week. And this is an example of, uh, of the Zimpro shoot. And so this is one where we've seen on, on a few farms that do have this in place where we can actually get that, that sow loaded and, and stabilized so that we can do that foot trimming uh, without having to try and uh, secure or tie or, or pull that leg back to do that trimming, because I, again, I get that. That's that's the hardest part of trimming toes and dew claws is is securing that leg for uh, for that trimming. And the last thing on, on lameness is just uh, for those of us that uh, that really like tracking and understanding uh, how an intervention or a, a treatment has improved lameness. Uh, this would be the uh, Zimpro has a, a nice app available for on-farm lameness and lesion evaluation. And so you can go through the farm and document either foot lesions or lameness um, on, on a number of sows. And, it, and it, it, uh, based on the size of the herd that you input, it gives you a statistical number on what number of sows it is that you need to evaluate. And then you can track that over time um, and see if an intervention or treatment has, has improved uh, the lameness score for your farm. So again, a, a, good, a good tool that's available to understand are we making a difference on, on lameness with interventions that we've, we've put in place. All right, so now we'll jump into prolapses. Uh, to start, we're gonna go over some general information about prolapses that you might or might not know. Um, and then we're going to jump into how much does a prolapse cost your farm, uh, kind of a summary of what one of our interns did this summer for us based on some work that Dr. Lewerke and Dr. Bruner done for a client. And then we're going to jump into some potential reasons why we're seeing an increase in prolapses and then some intervention strategies that our clinics tried. So with prolapses, it doesn't really seem to be any parity association. Uh, when these occur, it seems to follow a normal parity curve for a given sow farm. Uh, the highest risk time frame is generally going to be five days pre-ferro to five days post-ferro. That immediate time frame is when you're going to catch the majority of your prolapses that are going to occur. And then uh, one thing when talking with some other veterinarians or some people in the diagnostic lab just shooting ideas around, it's they would comment like, oh, we don't know which, which girl's going to prolapse. Uh, so. For me, I've been on a farm and working with staff, it seems like we we're able to identify some of those animals, uh, higher risk, right around that time of farrowing. Uh, so the signs that we normally see will be constipation, kind of a, a bulging perianal area where sure, vulvar will swell, uh, you can get some edema there, some bulge, and then excess straining with that back leg pushed forward, arched back, pushing really hard, straining, but no piglets. Uh, and that's not to say that's every sow. Uh, you still come in and find the one that you were just doing rounds and you're doing rounds every 30 minutes and she prolapsed and for no reason you, there was no sign ahead of time. But not always the case. And then uh, we do see it more in highly productive animals, posted quite a few of these and ends up being you know ones with 18 total born, all big pigs, that kind of sow is your typical profile. Uh, so this would have been another MetaFarms graph uh, put together in a Feedstuffs article. And just kind of looking at, you know, our prolapse is really going up based off the records that we have for removals. And this is a percent prolapse over total average sow inventory, not mortality, just to be clear. So we look at 2013, and yep, right around 0.8 under there, and then 2017 would be jumped up to that 1.2 range. <coughs> so... 
Again, over total average sow inventory, that, that actually no, number is a lot bigger than what you expect. And then here we're looking at total removals due to prolapse over a calendar year, and this is based off an eight-year data set provided by MetaFarms. And what we're really looking to put this graph together to show is a seasonal uh, association with the winter months for prolapses, um, which is kind of opposite of mycotoxin season when you think about when you're cleaning out bins in that summer time frame. So now we'll jump into what, what's a prolapse cost you on your farm. Uh, like I said, this was done by one of our interns, Taylor Holman, who's a student at University of Minnesota. And she put this together based off some previous work from Brad and Bruner. Uh, so the, big, the three big categories is really comes back to you're going to have to replace that animal with a gilt. Uh, you're going to bump up your selection rate to do that. You lose the coal value because she's euthanized or most of your prolapses will end up dying. And then you lose the wean pig cost. And like I said, that high hit time frame is going to be five days pre farrow to five days post farrow. Uh, so you can end up having a lot of these sows in pig at the time of their death. So here's the example 2,500 head sow farm. Uh, and this cost estimates utilizing records from 2013. So 4% of their total removals in 2013 were due to prolapse. And that ended up being 101 extra sows. So assuming $250 a gilt ballpark, that's $25,000 $25, a year, 10 bucks a sow. So then we looked at lost wean pit cost. 88% of the sows, according to some record analysis on our end, was determined to be in pig at the time of prolapse. So assuming $28 a wean pig, and this should be 10 and a half wean pigs per sow, uh, we got about $30,000 in loss there. And today, you know, $80 a wean pig, that would be even more drastic. So our coal opportunity loss, 76% of the prolapses for that year ended up dying. So looking at this is based off July AMS data uh, is where we got our values from. So $380 for a coal sow ended up being another $30,000, $11 a sow. So our total cost for 2013 was $85,000 and $34 a sow per average breeding inventory sow, and then $850 per prolapse removal, which is quite a staggering number. So now we're going to kind of look at why a recent increase in sow prolapse. Uh, one thing that we kind of came to first was feed. You know, we're asking sows to do more than they ever have before, but are we feeding them the same? Are we changing, is changing with the sows? Are we doing enough here? Another, another option is mycotoxins. Uh, the, the data, that seasonality trend disagrees, uh, or maybe our mycotoxin research isn't where it should be today. <coughs> Uh, another, another option would be mineral imbalance, uh, a hypocalcemia, uh, diet or phytase effect. Calcium is really important in smooth muscle contractions, um, so we could be mess missing something there. We could have increased abdominal pressure uh, right around that pre farrowing time. This makes a lot of sense. And, you know, do we have constipation that flares up with higher, litter, larger litter sizes, more total born, increased birth weight? Etc. And then hormonal pressure, this increased total born, increased birth weight. Could there be some increase in estrogen levels pre pharaoh that would loosen the cervix, cause increased uterine contractions, and increase the chance for prolapse? So all of these are best guesses at this point. There needs to be more research done to really nail this down. Uh, but this is kind of when we're looking at prolapses and intervention strategies that we're going to try, this is our potential risk or potential list of risk factors. And likely this is going to be a multifactorial problem. So you look at these and you think, okay, here's feed. How much of the pie does feed influence? And that's really what you kind of look at, and that's where the future research needs to be done to determine the cause and effects. So whenever we've made the decision of, okay, we're going to do an intervention and this is what we're going to try. It's been based off of uh, that previous figure and what we've really had the best success at is manipulating the feed pre -feral. So we've added a mycotoxin binder, try and fight mycotoxins if that's 
part of the problem. We've put on a top dress containing a laxative, and that's helped on farms. Um, and then sometimes the laxative isn't all you need, so we end up throwing a CalFOS supplement on there to see if there's any mineral imbalance that we're missing. Uh, we've even had some farms go all the way to a full transition diet who've had the bin space and gestation to do so. And some other things that we've tried, um, none of these are going to be perfect, right? I mean, there's no, there's no one-size-fits-all for prolapse interventions. So we limit-fed pre uh, right there focusing on the increased abdominal pressure theory and increased assistance during farrowing, but on some farms that you feel like you get the pigs out of the sow who looks like she's at a high risk to prolapse, uh, straining, you know, uh, maybe starting to prolapse a little bit, and then if you get the pigs out of her, she seems to settle down and stop pushing so hard. Now that, in my experience, has been a pretty high risk, low reward option, and you really don't save a, m a bunch of sows out of that. But for me, it's worth doing. If you get one, it's important. We just looked at the cost of that, and that's $850. So, and then we also uh, recommended injectable CalFOS just to make sure that we're not missing anything on mineral balance there. And then <laughs> walking sows is really a good therapeutic option. Uh, it's cheap, easy to do, and sometimes getting her up and just letting her have the chance to defecate, urinate, walk around, gets her going a little bit better, and, uh, one of those that, yeah, you can walk a prolapse sow, and maybe at the end of the day she's still going to prolapse, but you tried something. So these two forms, this would be uh, on the left here is from Iowa State's Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. That's a submission sheet, kind of a checklist, and then Swine Vet Center's checklist is on the right, their prolapse checklist, and both of these serve to gather information around prolapse, prolapses, and what we're looking to do is build a database of information that we can make a move with and go find some more research and do a better job of collecting data and pinpointing what we need to do to fix this problem. So the summary here, <clears throat> there's still more to learn. Uh, our best successes have come from trying multiple different things on farm, whether you, know, you started a laxative top dress and, hey, that changed everything. I went from four prolapses a week to now I have one a month. Great, that worked. Uh, but if that doesn't work, then we're going to look at, you know, doing a CalFOS supplement as well on top of that laxative. Or, hey, could you have this bin space to do a transition diet? Are you interested in that? You know, that's where, that's where we've really made the most bang for our buck is saying we're not going to stop at one thing. We're going to keep attacking the potential risk factors on our checklist and work through the problem. With that, I'll hand her off to you. Say, Henry, in general, the summary of prolapses is probably not a whole lot further ahead on cause, but we have had some success on farms trying some of these interventions, and so keep trying those and, and keep accumulating data with the Iowa State group and, and try to figure out what things are commonalities of prolapses then. Yep, you know, tertiary cause and effect would be the next biggest step for prolapses, uh, but we have had success going off what we know now. So the other, the other section or the other, the other cause of mortality that, uh, that we see on farms is, is this uh, kind of catch-all, sudden or unknown cause of death. And, and I would say that what I see on farms uh, when we post sows, we miss, a, we miss a big opportunity to understand exactly why a number of these sows die. Again, we, we classify it as unknown, but we don't take that extra step of opening up sows to, to try and help us understand what is the cause of, of some of these, uh, these deaths that do happen. So in general, and I would say I'm the same way, posting sows can be pretty discouraging. You know, a number, number of things. One, they're just sometimes hard to post, and so it's not the first thing we want to do on farm day to day is, is open up dead sows that have occurred throughout the day. And there's a lot of times where we open up those sows and there's really nothing visual that says, yep, this is why she died, and, and we can put an intervention for a sow that looks this way, and, and we won't have a, another dead that's caused by that. So, so it's, it's, it's frustrating, uh, but I would say that if we get enough sows opened up, we're, we're able to make some conclusions on, on some of these unknown causes of, of death. And I would say for those of us that, that, that post sows or, or farms that routinely are posting, they, they just develop a, a quick checklist of, I'm going to run through these, these body systems, 
make a, a check of if there's any abnormalities, and then, um, and again, if it's unknown because we didn't have abnormalities in those checks, then, then it's a, a true unknown. But, uh, you know, commonly, you know, check of the uterus for retained pigs or, or uh, infection, checking for an ulcer off feed, and then just that heart and lung check, is there, is there pneumonia or is there some bacterial infections that we can, we can uh, say, yep, visually that's what happened and, and uh, that's the cause of death. Again, I think it's important because we really are blind unless we, unless we start opening up some sows and understanding exactly why we're seeing, why we're seeing deads. And, and again, it's, um, when you see retained pigs and placenta, you kind of have that area to investigate in, in the farm. Ulcers the same way. You know, as, you, as you start to open up a number of these uh, animals and, and take a look and send pictures to, to your veterinarians and, and around through the, through the group, you start figuring out some, some commonalities and can really focus on areas, whether that be simply sleeving more sows and documenting that they're done, or a change in the antibiotic program based on, on bacterial infection, or a change in feed based on, on ulcers or, or those types of things. Again, it, it gives you more information to be able to, uh, be able to make some of those, those calls. And remember that, uh, and I have to remind myself of this too, that uh, a single post-mortem finding isn't indicative of what's going on in the herd. We have lots of reasons that sows die, and so uh, again, that's where numbers help add confidence into what's going on uh, in those sudden or unknown causes of, of sow mortality. Just some examples of, of things that, uh, you know, all of us in the room should be able to open up a sow and diagnose. Uh, this is a, uh, a uterine, so retained pigs and, and uterine infection. And so again, we open up that, that sow and the uterus has got retained pigs. There's, there's uh, uterine infection. And so again, a, a pretty easy one to call. That's, that's why that sow died. An example of a, of a stomach ulcer. So again, a sow that's been off feed for a, a number of days develops a, a stomach ulcer. And so again, it, it helps point us in the direction of where we, where we need to attack or where we need to look at, especially if we're finding more and more and more of these types of animals on post-mortem. An example of, of a ASUAS, a bacterial infection that, that can cause sudden death in, in adult animals. And so again, as we get good at, at looking at this stuff, we can identify that, yep, there's the, there's the lesion of ASUAS, we have uh, multiple animals that have had or presented that way, and then, and then discuss what is the, the right antibiotic treatment to put in place to, to prevent those from happening. I would say for farms, you know, in general, it's good to have uh, the tools available to, to post sows, and usually it helps to have someone that likes or, or enjoys or can do that also. But make sure we have the tools on farm to be able to open those sows up. And I'm not saying every animal needs to be, but by getting into a routine where a few every week or, or one a day or something like that to, to again start building that database on, on what causes of unknown deads are. And then, and then routinely evaluate that too. So we had 20 deads this month and 15 were going to be classified as unknown, but as we further break it down because we posted, this was the breakdown, we can start implementing treatments or prevention strategies to try and reduce that, that mortality caused by that, that reason. Can't have two veterinarians up here without talking a little bit about disease. So just a couple of things on, on, on disease and its relation to mortality. And, and again, unfortunately, this time of year, we don't get too, uh, too cocky on disease prevention and, and healthy animals, but, uh, but definitely there's, there's a number of, of bacterial and viral infections that lead to mortality. In, in adult animals, and the big one still continues to be PERS, and, and certainly again this, this time of year we're, we're being humbled by PERS every day, but uh, it seems like new strains that they get into herds have this ability to cause a higher fever and more sick animals than, than they have in the past, and so that fever is certainly what, uh, what leads to high mortality, and we've, we see farms today that can double their mortality in, in a number of weeks just because that, uh, that dramatic fear that happens with a new PERS introduction. Multiple control strategies, tra strategies in place for PERS, and again, this is not a PERS discussion, but, but definitely we, we want to make sure we look at how we control virus on the farm. So whether that be elimination, vaccination, serum exposure, gild acclimation, but the big one to me 
is doing everything we can from a biosecurity standpoint and a testing standpoint to limit the introduction of that new virus, especially the, the strains of today that uh, seem to cause that dramatic fever event and mortality that uh, oftentimes feels like it gets out of control before we can, we can get ahead of it. And I would say the other part of a, of a PERS response plan is having that team in place out in the gestation barn to address those sows that are aborting. Uh, when we really look at, and again, going back to posting sows, when we really, really look at the heart of a, of a PERS break and start opening up those sows that, that die in gestation, granted the fever uh, had the initial effect, but a lot of those sows die from retained pigs, retained placenta, and uh, we're not gonna correct every one of those, but having a team out there that uh, can sleeve sows and, and uh, help those sows get cleaned out does have a dramatic effect on reducing mortality in the, in the heart of a PERS break. Influenza, you know, that one, that one certainly is, is frustrating for us. And again, it's the same type of thing, uh, albeit maybe not as dramatic. We get that fever event, and especially those late-bred sows that uh, um, have the stress of being late Late bread also, uh, we, we do see sows that die, we see sows that abort, and, and again, some of the same comments for flu as we'd have for PERS. Flu, unfortunately, has become, become pretty endemic in herds, and we have multiple strains that circulate through. Um, elimination has really, been, has really been tough, and so it'll be interesting to see uh, as we have some of the new vaccine technologies, uh, BI's modified live, the Optimune intranasal vaccine, can we have a better effect on, on uh, reducing those uh, dramatic flu breaks and fever events that, uh, that can lead to sow mortality. Mycoplasma, and Paul, you might get rid of all of it, but uh, that's the goal. But uh, we do know that instability, so when the gilts don't match the sow herd, so if you have negative gilts into a positive sow herd and that instability occurs, we know we get increased mortality, especially in young parity animals. And we are getting more and more negative herds, so, so that will help. But uh, I think the big message right for this group is that really the sows and the gilts need to match status. So if we're entering negative gilts into a positive farm, we really need to be getting those gilts at a young enough age, confirming they go positive so that we don't, uh, don't have that instability or that mycoplasma infection that happens when that gilt is mature or bred animal or, or late, uh, late gestation ready to farrow. And certainly, you know, multiple strategies that we have to, uh, to stabilize and eliminate mycoplasma. Ear syphilis, you know, that one we talked about ear syphilis for, for years and it still seems to, to pop up and, uh, and maybe that's because we have pulled back on some vaccination. Maybe there's other factors that, that, um, that allow ear syphilis to pop back up in a herd immune suppression from viral infections, all of those things are possible, but uh, uh, I think the, I mean, the most important thing is that we have a routine vaccination plan in place for, for your syphilis. To me, that's a, that's a no-brainer and uh, can reduce those sudden deaths that can occur from, from ear syphilis uh, break or infection. And again, that bug is fairly endemic, so, so again, vaccination, uh, because it is, is in the herd, and then bacterial pathogens, I, I talked about ASUAS earlier, but, but strep and, and Haemophilus parasuus, especially when we're bringing uh, gilt in that isn't used to that farm's bugs and we have to acclimate her, those, thing, those, those bacterial pathogens do cause mortality. And so, um, again, having an acclimation plan in place, and that can include exposure to animals from the farm, plus an antibiotic, plus a vaccination strategy, all of those things help reduce the severity of, of those uh, pathogens that the guilt does have to get exposed to as part of the acclimation process. So Henry and I, you know, we, we tried to brainstorm other ideas why we think, why we think mortality has increased on farms and, and pulled the, the rest of the young vet group at our, um, at Swine Vet Center. And, and kind of a common theme was, you know, bigger farms. And so we have, we have more farms that are larger in size today. So that means that, uh, uh, in general, especially with uh, um, employee or labor shortages and maybe with a workforce, probably with a workforce that's got less animal experience, we have less people spread out over those animals. And so again, when we talk about daily observation and really understanding what's going on in each sow throughout the herd, 
that becomes really tough as, as farm size grows and labor, labor shortages uh, increase. So where does it start? I think, I think a big one is just getting the basics right. And, and for all of us that start on a, on a sow farm or in grow finish, you know, we PQ, poor quality assurance and transfer quality assurance are, are big parts of that training program. And there's a lot of good basic information. Granted, it's, it's getting that implemented across the entire sow herd so that every sow is observed every day. But, but we have a lot of good tools out there already to train how to take care of sows day to day. So Henry and I, you know, we talked about it. Sure, it's, it's good to tell the audience, yep, every sow every day, and, uh, and things will be better. But um, that may not, may not be the case. And what we really wanted to uh, look at is, are there subsets of sows in a herd that are at higher risk of, of mortality compared to others? And so with the help of MetaFarms, we, um, we looked at, and this, this, these two tables show the... Uh, in that MetaFarms database, looking at the percent mortality by week for the last five years. And so again, we've got uh, gestation, the weeks of gestation and the, and the weeks of, of lactation. And so a couple of interesting things, and it probably goes without saying, we, we know that late gestation, early farrowing is the highest risk time. And it really, really pointed that fact out that, you know, we have a bulk of our sows that die um, in that last couple weeks of gestation in that first week, week and a half of, of lactation for all causes. This isn't just one, one cause in general, that's all mortality. So, so I think that, that says, yep, we're going to look at every sow every day, but these groups, these three weeks, four weeks worth of, of a 20-week cycle are really the ones that we want to spend some extra time and attention with. So you think about it, you know, as we, as we talk about just general chores and, and taking care of animals in the gestation barn, you know, I think all of us can ask ourselves, how much, are we, how much time are we spending in the gestation barn caring for sows? Hopefully it's more than 20 minutes. I would, I would really hope that's the case. And you really do the math. If you spend just 10 seconds per sow, it's, that's two and a half hours per thousand. So that's, that's almost, on a, on a larger farm, that's almost a full-time employee plus just to make sow observations, treatments, and reobserve the next day as to whether or not uh, the treatment that you put in place is having some effect. I think the basics still hold true, and so every sow up every day, did she finish her meal? Um, lame or any other issues? So again, that, that 10 seconds is used up pretty quickly if we're, if we're making all those assessments on each sow in the herd. And especially if we're doing maybe another assessment on those those last few weeks of gestation, and, and hopefully that's happening again in, in farrowing, those first uh, high-risk weeks of, of farrowing. And then I think the big thing that we, we, I wouldn't say we fail to do, but we're probably poor at doing is, is making a reevaluation of that animal the next day and the next day. Did the treatment we put in place have any effect? If it didn't, what's the next step? If it did, then again, making sure that uh, we don't have that animal go backwards and, and are dealing with the same issue uh, with that animal post-treatment. I think treatment, you know, to me, treatment is, a, is kind of an emergency type response. And so I find a sick animal this morning, waiting until this afternoon at 3 or 4 o'clock to treat that animal is probably not the right response. And so treatment should be an immediate, an immediate thing. And, uh, and I think it's important also to have, working with your veterinarian, to have protocols in place that, yep, we know our herd deals with bacteria A, B, and C, these are the antibiotics of choice that we're going to use for those pathogens that are in, in our herd. So again, having up-to-date protocol and treating on a, in a timely fashion to get the best, best response. I talked about it you know, a couple slides ago, but really making that reevaluation. Did our treatment help? If it didn't, then we need to rethink what our treatment strategy is and or Probably the next step is getting some sampling done, that posting of sows done to understand is there something we're missing uh, as to why those animals are dying. And then providing extra care. So we talk about an antibiotic treatment. That one's easy because we can put it in a syringe and we can inject that animal and we've, we've treated that sow. We can do the same with anti-inflammatory. But there's some other things, especially when we, we talk about lame sows or sows with shoulder sores, those types of things that could lead to, to further uh, systemic infections. What other things can we do for those animals? 
put a mat underneath that, underneath that sow that's lame or, or uh, mats that are available for shoulder sores and, and addressing that so that it doesn't become worse and become a, an ailment or an injury or a lesion that we can't uh, heal or address. So again, it, it goes more than just antibiotic and anti-inflammatory treatment. Feed intake, pretty basic. But uh, that's one of the things, one of the only things we have as an indicator of how that sow is feeling day to day. And so, again, in our, in our farms today, we really have the ability to, to monitor, did she clean up her feed? Is the feed fresh? And uh, we do have the ability or should have the ability to provide ad-lib feeding to those sows that are, that are less than ideal body condition. And so, again, it goes back to those basics. Did she eat today? If she didn't, what's the... What's the treatment plan in place to address that? And then how do we reevaluate that, that we had an effect? Same with water. And again, I, I get it. This gets really basic, but it's, it's a big deal, and it is missed uh, on farms. And so hydration is, is uh, terribly important for, for overall sow health. Water intake leads to feed intake. And uh, it's amazing the number of times we go through farms and, and gilts don't understand the nipple and farrowing because that's the first time they've been exposed to it. Or the end of the G-barn, we have the last five to ten sows that didn't receive water because of a, a feed bridge or something like that. And so those, those basic things are, are certainly important in, in maintaining health. And it does have a, an effect on, on future mortality of, of those animals. Uh, body condition, just a couple slides on that, and, and I would say that uh, uh, more of the comments on, on the under-conditioned sow. Uh, over-conditioned sows are a risk for mortality too, but the under-conditioned ones, uh, they certainly are a, an increased risk for lameness. And so we talked about lameness earlier, uh, lameness and, and how many of those sows are what the risk is for, for that sow dying. And, um, and so uh, I would say that in general, uh, a, skinny, uh, a thin sow or underconditioned sow, we need to do everything we can to try and bring that animal back into condition or it is going to be a, a higher mortality uh, for the farm. So the basics again apply to how we feed underconditioned sows. So putting them on a self-feeder, having the ability to just have that animal on full feed or ad-lib feed at all times to get that condition right. Again, because if we don't, that, that sow will become a, a mortality. Implementing conditioning protocols. So body conditioning can be quite subjective. And so we've got new tools today. Uh, a caliper is a, is a good example on, on a tool that we have to make sure that body condition is consistently measured and accounted for on farm. And so, again, having a, a conditioning plan in place, whether that's at a, a breeding 30 days, 60 days pre farrow or however that looks for your farm, making sure that's done each week and making sure that we have a much like treatment, a plan in place for those sows that become thin or sows that are overconditioned. What things do we do to get that back into ideal condition in the shortest amount of time? Other opportunities to reduce mortality, more, more to the farrowing side of things, and, and again, uh, basic things in my mind, but um, uh, assisting farrowings in, in reduction of, of of retained pigs, especially in sick herds, but even, even healthy herds. We, we probably have more retained pig sow deaths because we uh, don't do a good job on documenting that the sow is done. And I think that becomes even more true today when we get 24-hour staffing where the overnight shift may not be directly communicating with the, the morning shift. And so understanding what happened during the night, so the morning and vice versa knows exactly. So it, it takes documenting that, yep, the sow is done. We know that because of these reasons, and, and that sow should be, should be ready to go as far as uh, eating, drinking, lactating, and, and having a productive lactation. Henry talked about calcium for, for prolapses. Calcium is also important for just general uterine contractions, so those sows that are having a hard time pushing pigs out or, or are at risk for well, stillborns and retains due to history. Um, calcium is a good option to, to try and help that, that uterine contraction and get those, those pigs ferret out so we have less retained sows. And then, and then clearly getting sows up to eat and drink post-farrowing. Um, I would say that in general we have, uh, with automated feeding systems, we maybe don't do as good of a job on monitoring that, yep, I'm done farrowing and I started eating. But there are some ways, that, creative ways that we can do that. 
And so, again, getting those sows up post farrowing to make sure that we get a good start on feed and water intake is, is certainly important for reducing that, that first week to 10 days uh, sow removal from farrowing and sow mortality. Another, another uh, objective measurement or tool that we have is, is taking, taking rectal temps on sows post farrow. I'm not sure how many in the room uh, are routinely doing that for their sows post farrowing, but again, it's a great tool that's available to say, yep, we got a, a fever or infection or something is going on and determine that, that body temperature that, that signifies that, and then we can put an intervention in place. And again, it may not be a, an antibiotic treatment that happens, but we say at this temperature this happens and, and the farm follows that. It's a, it's a way to measure um, that, uh, it's, a, it's a tool that's available to, to, to measure versus us trying to just make a, a visual assessment our, ourselves. And then walking sows, we, we do know that um, sows that, that fail to eat post farrowing, uh, eat and drink post farrowing, one, one thing that we have available to do is walk those sows and, and uh, uh, it's amazing. Tim will tell the story often that, uh, you know, you get that sow to walk, she, she urinates, defecates outside of the crate, goes back in and, and starts eating and lays down and nurses her pigs, and, and that plays out more often than not. And so it's a, it's a way to get that sow into that routine of eating, drinking, and, and nursing that litter. And I covered this a little bit already, but just timely treatment. And, and don't forget about anti-inflammatory options. A lot of the things that happen are, are fever-related or, or inflammation-related. And so, again, we don't have a, a ton of anti-inflammatory options, but we do have some, and, and that's an important part of a, of a treatment protocol for, for sows, gestation and, and farrowing. Henry, wrap it up here. Thanks. All right, so we want to wrap it up by touching on culling, um, and then we'll get into some swine vets that are non-negotiables to make sow death loss a priority on your farm. So uh, culling, we're euthanizing more sows today than in the past uh, traditionally would have gone onto a cull trailer. So that, that is affecting sow mortality. Uh, and then it also affects the farm because you have less incentive to cull bred animals due to targets for today. And so you end up keeping lower quality animals to meet targets, and you can get in that downward spiral where you have a larger, pop an ever growing population of low quality breeding animals. Uh, and so then, uh, culling frequency, we look at are we culling sows as needed, culling animals as needed, or are we trying to reduce uh, risk and biosecurity by having that cull trailer back up less frequently? And we really should be culling sows as needed, that way we are targeting sow mortality and getting value out of that animal. So I'll wrap it up here with the SVC non-negotiables. Uh, Brad and I came up with these and tried to come up with an even number of 10. Uh, number one, make sow death loss a priority to farm staff. You know, is this as important as pre-wean? Is this as important as any other production target? You know, this is, this is what we have to do to establish a change in this, <coughs> in sow mortality. Every animal up every day. I'm sure you've heard a lot of people say that before. Uh, we like to recommend that high-risk animals, you know, make a list, turn that into a feral lead, uh, have that list, and say, I'm going to circle back and look at her again today. Uh, you know, take a temperature, intervene as you need. Implement a guilt selection program. Make sure you're bringing in the highest quality breeding stock possible onto your farm. Uh, the fourth one would be fresh food and fresh water. Uh, Brad brought up the classic example of a gilt and farrowing crate whose water source is now above her head and for the entire portion of her life before that farrowing crate, it's been below her head. Uh, so that it is important and it's amazing how many times you can go on a farm and still see that pop up. Post sows as often as possible is our fifth one. Uh, it's, for us, is a big area. You know, it's sending a lot of those girls out the door and unknowns, and you can gain a lot of information from those. And that, that information can be used as training opportunities for your farm staff and really dialing in on what's going on to your farm and how do we fix that. And then six would be timely treatment of sick, sick animals. Uh, it's a must on every farm and I think something everyone strives for. Seven, uh, supplemental care. You know, we don't want to just look at antibiotics. But this is where Brad talked about putting that mat with holes in, on a slippery crate so the animal doesn't splay. 
Uh, you don't you don't want to get one that plays on you, and then you have to euthanize her because she's lame and won't go on a truck, and then figure out a way to get her pigs out the door too. Uh, same thing uh, with shoulder sores. You know, put a nice comfy mat under her, try and reduce that lesion. Rectal temp sows post ferro. Uh, an intervention on this can it doesn't have to be an antibiotic. It can be an NSAID, uh, get her up walker, anything like that. Whatever you're comfortable with on your farm. Nine, uh, get body condition right. Brad just touched on this. Uh, it's really important on farm. You come up with a Implement a program of, yep, we're going to check sows at this time frame, and then we're going to do a recheck after we adjust feeders and make sure that we get sows where they need to be body condition-wise. And then want to stabilize herd health. Uh, probably one of the most important on our list and one of the hardest to do sometimes, but a bad PERS break can double your mortality for the year, so essential. All right, uh, so we'll wrap up here and just want to say thanks to MetaFarms, uh, particularly Brad Eckberg for working with us on this and helping put together some of the graphs and we'll open it up to any questions that you guys might have now.